What's up guys? We're back with another Spike Engineering AMA and this time we're talking about this guy, the Spike Glycol Chiller. I'm Taylor. I'm Adam. I'm Caleb. Let's get into it. So the first question that we have, you guys, is Aaron asks, will you be coming out with a smaller unit? And like, honestly, I think it's a pretty good size as is. So we looked at what this kind of chiller needs to have all the right features uh, to perform well. And even when you make it smaller, you still gotta have a lot of the, the main things. You gotta have a big enough reservoir, you gotta have enough power, the right refrigerant, um, so, you know, you got to kind of pack all those features and making it a little bit smaller really doesn't save a whole lot of money to the customer. And so we kind of really tried to find just like the right size for someone doing one fermenter or even up to four fermenters and getting the price as optimized as we can so that you're getting a really good unit. It's not quite as small as it could be, but it's going to far outperform uh, a small unit and really set you up for growth in your brewery. So to answer your question, Aaron, no, there won't be another size because it's perfect as is. Next question. This is from Steve and he wants to know how do the glycol lines connect to the chiller? Caleb? So Taylor, yeah, you're right. So we're using quick connect fittings that go in and out really easily. I'll demonstrate how they work. Um, essentially push in and pull out. So I have it pushed in here. As you can see, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna be a watertight connection. It's not gonna leak at all. When I wanna take it out, all I do is push the tab in and pull out like normal. So it's really simple, really easy, no tools, and you should be good to go. And the cool thing is that these are connected to the machine from the outside. So you don't need to open up the lid and stick hoses down into your pumps and kind of get your hands all dirty with glycol. And uh, it's really simple and easy to use. And these are the same tubes that come in our TC100 kit. Correct? Yep, yep. So that's the half inch size, the TC100 tubes, and it'll work with your old tubes or the ones you might have now. So. Quick moves, quick connect, we love. Yes. Okay, next question comes in from Kevin and he wants to know how many fermenters can this chiller uh, control at one time? So there's four ins and four outs, uh, you know, one for each fermenter and that's really what we set it up for. And in terms of capacity, it's, it's hard to say what it can do because every brewery is different. Everybody has different size fermenters, everybody has different needs, different glycol line lengths, that all plays into consideration, but in general, Here's what we come up with. Yeah, so we uh, uh, have it set up with the obviously the four fermenters. If you're cold crashing, obviously that's the toughest job for a chiller, and you're doing uh, any of the big ones like the CF30 or you know one barrel size fermenters, you can do two cold crashing at a time or four of the smaller ones, um, like you know flex, CF5, CF10, that kind of thing. Um, as far as just running and keeping them at temperature. Um, you know, you can definitely do four, all four units and just kind of hold, hold the temperatures you need to, you know, 60, 70 degrees for uh, fermentation. All right, this next question comes in from Todd and he wants to know why is there a drain port in the chillers on the bottom? So Todd, this is a good, great, great question because a lot of our competitors don't have that and we thought it was very important to include because if you ever need to drain this, move it to a different house or move it to a different area, a lot of times what happens is the glycol is slosh around. So it's it makes very a, convenient. It makes it a lot heavier too, right? Yeah, it makes it very convenient to move around if you can drain it. Now, most of the time you have to drain it out the top, so you have to have some sort of pump that brings the liquid out. Here we're using gravity. So there's a, there's a uh, funnel down here, brings it all down, and gravity does the job, and it gets everything nice and cleaned out for you before you want to move it. It's a simple thing, but it makes a big difference. Totally, because it's really heavy. Yeah. It's sturdy. Yep. Okay, so the next few questions have to do with inside the tank. Mm -hmm. So people yep. are wondering, how many gallons should we fill this up to? How do you prevent freezing? And specifically, what is the ratio between propylene glycol and water? Yeah, great question. Obviously, it's kind of one of the first things you do. Um, so this is designed for a seven and a half gallon fill. So the way, obviously, like you mentioned for freezing, so you don't just put water in here because otherwise it's gonna freeze. You're gonna mix that with propylene glycol 
uh, at a certain ratio in order to you know prevent freezing and be able to really drive the temperatures down. So um, we've designed this for a two to one ratio of water to glycol mixture. Um, and we're trying to make that convenient by also offering um, you know, available for purchase with this unit is a two and a half gallon glycol container. And so the beauty of that is, you know, you dump that two and a half gallon in, you dump in five gallons of distilled water with it, and then your mixture is pretty much perfectly set at the recommended fill level for this unit. Um, and that glycol that we're selling with it, it's kind of optimized food grade. It's got the um, antimicrobial inhibitors and things to prevent it from degrading. Um, it's pretty much like purpose for this type of application. So you're not so, going to open the lid and there's going to be little like creepy crawlers. No creepy there. crawlies. No, no. <laughs> so cool. all about making it easy. Yep. And speaking of making it easy, the propylene glycol is something that we're going to have on stock henceforth and forevermore. Mm -hmm. So if you run out yep. or you need something else, you need some more silicone tubing or brewery wash, you can always throw that in your cart Yep. and it's good. Next question is from Josh and he wants to know, so why doesn't our unit have built in pumps or controllers? Mm. Caleb, do you wanna speak to that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, there's two reasons mainly that we decided to go that way. We looked at both options and they're both legit options, but ultimately we decided on no built-in because if you have a built-in unit and if something goes wrong with it, it fails, your whole unit is worthless. You can't fix it, it's, you have to go into it, you lose your warranty. So by having an exterior, if something goes bad, then you just replace that one controller and move on with your life. In addition, uh, a lot of people are only running one or two or maybe three fermenters at the same time. So if you pay for a uh, chiller that has controls for four, you're really paying for all that. So this is the way you can kind of build your brewery as you go. It's a modular system. So you only pay for what you actually need. Okay, this next question comes from Jimmy, and he wants to know, what is the sight glass on the side used for? And I'll tell you what, Jimmy, this is used so that you can easily check the levels inside your reservoir without having to open up the lid, affecting the temperature, mm -hmm. and like basically just ease of use. Yeah, I mean, if you run this thing and uh, you know, you got a lot of long lines and all of a sudden, you know, you can see that liquid level go down. You can see, oh, I got to top off a little bit with a little bit of extra water mm -hmm. um, and just kind of make sure you keep the level right where you want it, even no matter what's going on with uh, what fermenters you have hooked up and stuff. Yeah, everybody's got different systems out there and everybody's going to use a different amount of glycol. And even though you fill it up with seven and a half gallons at the beginning, it doesn't mean after you fill up your whole system, you're going to have seven and a half gallons left. And that might affect your performance. So it's just an easy way to check it out. Don't have to mess around with the lid. You just look at it and add and whatever you need. Mm -hmm. So like we really think of everything. We kind of do. Nice of us. The next question comes in from Matt and he asks, well, you guys say that our temp controller is easier to use. We say that on the website, you guys have been saying it, but like why? What is it about our temp controller that other systems don't have or make more difficult? So every temp controller is a little bit different, but what you'll see on most of them is, is there's, uh, you know, obviously up and down and then there's usually a power button, but then there's also settings that sometimes you get lost in. And I've been playing with a lot of these controllers and I feel like I know how to work them, but I always get lost somehow. And I can never get back to what I want to do, which is set the temperature, move it up or down, and then turn it on or off. And then maybe I want to change Celsius to Fahrenheit. That's all I want to do. It's, it's very simple. It shouldn't be difficult. So what we did is, is we made it so you can only set the temperature, and change from Celsius to Fahrenheit. That's it. You cannot change anything else, if, no matter how hard you try, and it should be simple and easy to use. And that's all you really got to do, right? Set your temperature and go. That's what this chiller is about. Looks good, simple to use. That's pretty much been like our theme of products coming out in the last year or so. Like if you want the temp to go up, you press up. If you want it to go down, press down. You're not dealing with any PID controllers. And right. honestly, we can speak to certainty with this because we have, what, four or five other competitor units upstairs that we've been running, testing, making sure that ours is exactly that. Yeah. Superior. And you really shouldn't have to go into like a user manual or search online to find out the instructions and how to use this thing. And this you can pretty much pull right out of the box and turn it on and figure it out in like 10 seconds. So next question is from Scott and he wants to know, how does the cord routing work for the submersible pumps? Yeah, good question. So yeah, obviously you've got gonna have, you know, anywhere from one up to four submersible pumps inside. Each one of those has to get powered um, separately, right? Plugged into the wall. So 
Um, the great thing is you really don't have to route any of the main glycol lines, right? Because those are all hard plumbed into the sides of the unit. Uh, but then the cords can get bunched up and we're gonna have a, a small cutout in the back of the insulation here so that when the lid's closed, open, it's going through a small little hole and then that can be uh, routed out the back of the unit and then plugged into your wall outlet or a power strip or wherever, whatever it might be. Uh, very neat, very easy to manage and you know can kind of go both directions and it um, keeps it a clean insulation. And that design kind of dovetails off of the overall aesthetic, right? Because a lot of chillers, they have all their guts on the outside, right? Right. And so when you thought about rerouting the cords, you don't want them like all in front. Yeah, or sticking big, you know, sticking yeah, them out the yeah. top and having to kind of, yep, yeah, so. Love it. Yeah. This next question is from Dave and he wants to know, can I reuse the submersible pumps and or controllers that I already have? And honestly, like I can't remember what those look like, but I think we have some of those in house. That's right, here they are. And, and the good thing about this is, you know, if you already own this, you bought the TC100 kit or several kits, you do not need to replace these. These will be uh, directly compatible with our chiller. If you use these on a different chiller, a different manufacturer, it doesn't matter, they can go right on here, control your uh, temperatures and fermentation. So there's no need to throw away any perfectly good home brewing pumps controllers that you have. We do have the TC100 for sale in our accessories collection, however. Yeah, I mean, if you've got this work. already, this will work perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, next question is from Sam, and this is one of the most frequently asked questions, so we're really excited that we get to answer this today. So this is from Sam, and he wants to know, how loud is the spike glycol chiller compared to other units? And honestly, Sam, we have, what, four units uh, upstairs, two of our main competitors, you know who you are, yeah. and uh, Caleb actually just finished all that testing. So do you wanna kinda go yeah. through that? Really great results from this testing. We tried to keep everything very uh, consistent between every single test to make sure that we were not biasing towards us or somebody else or vice versa. And what we found is that the spike is, is by, by far the, the quietest out of the, the chillers we've tested. And basically, for, for you numbers guys out there, we're getting about 48 dB. That's equivalent to a maybe a household refrigerator, maybe even a little bit quieter than that. So you're not gonna really notice this thing running. If you have it in your basement, you're never gonna notice it. Even if you have it in your, in your living room, wherever you brew, you're not gonna notice it. It's really quiet, it works really well, and I think you're gonna be really happy with the results. So last question, we saved the best for last. Mm -hmm. And this one, we have been having people write in ever since we came out with the announcement of the glycol chiller. And that is the long awaited, what is the BTU of this unit? Mm -hmm. Based on our testing, we're getting a number of 2,300 BTUs. Now that number, I'll go into a little bit of how we got it. Um, and, and then I'll go into how it kind of maybe compares other units that we've seen in uh, our competitor space. So basically what we did is, is we say, okay, we cannot you know, have any fermenters hooked up to this because everybody's system is different. Every time you bring glycol out of here, it's going to heat up from the ambient environment. So it's really not fair to have you know, a glycol line come here and then a fermenter here. So what we did is we brought the heat to the chiller itself. So instead of you know, cooling beer, it's, uh, we put a heater inside of here. So we monitored the heat that goes in and the job of the chiller is to get heat out, right? Which so, is really a more direct way of... Yeah, it, it isolates the chiller itself and it gets rid of all the variables that, you know, if you have, you, you ruin your basement or you ruin upstairs or whatever, or we have different conicals or whatever, it gets rid of all that and isolates what the chiller can do. So we monitored what the power went in and then we monitored the power coming out. And once those two equalized, that's how we found out this number. So it was consistent across all of our units and, and we found that that was the best way to really give a good scientific answer to this question. And the problem we were running into is, you know, a lot of people we feel like exaggerate their, their results. They, they test in a very favorable environment so they can get the most favorable numbers. But what we did is we tried to control our ambient environment. We tried to control everything we can because then we're doing a real apples to apples comparison and this is the data and we're, we're, we're showing it to you guys and we're gonna put it on the website for everybody to see, so. And that's all part of our process, right? So like every video that we've been doing about our new products this year, everything right. that you've designed, you've designed, this intense level of controlled testing goes into everything. So like when we, 
make a claim like this, it's backed on actual testing and evidence. Yeah, I mean, it's no BS. This is how a brewer is going to use it, what they're, what mm -hmm. they're exactly getting, uh, rather than, uh, you know, exaggerated ratings or, yeah. or perfect conditions. Um, you know, there's a hundred variables that can go into it and you can definitely, you know, turn the knob to get the, the numbers you want. And we really tried to replicate what, what this exact unit can do mm -hmm. and isolate it to the chiller itself and rather the other variables. All right, well, that is a wrap. That's all the questions. We hope that we were able to answer all your deep, your dark, your burning questions about the new spike glycol chiller. Stay tuned. There's going to be more information rolling out on this bad boy literally in the next couple of months or so. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our customer experience team. They're literally waiting to answer your questions. Thank you. <laughs> That's all the time we have for you. Thanks, guys. See you later.